Right, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all here. And now, usually I start something with, um, you know, with the children um, and tell them a story. But today, I'm not going to tell you a story. I'm just going to show you a story. So if you just can all make sure that you can see the screen behind me, and then I'll say something about that. Jean-Francois Gravelet, better known as Blondine, was a famous tightrope walker and acrobat. He's perhaps best known for his many crossings of the tightrope, 1,100 feet in length, suspended 160 feet above Niagara Falls in the USA. His act would be watched by large crowds and begin with a relatively simple crossing using a balancing pole. Then he would throw away the pole and amaze the onlookers. On one occasion, he crossed the tightrope on stilts. On another occasion, blindfolded. Another time, he stopped halfway to cook and eat an omelet. In 1860, a royal party from England came to watch Blondin perform. After his normal spectacular crossings, he then wheeled a wheelbarrow from one side to the other as the crowd cheered. Next, he put a sack of potatoes into the wheelbarrow and wheeled that across. The crowd cheered louder. Then he approached the royal party and asked the Duke of Newcastle, Do you believe that I could take a man across the tightrope in this wheelbarrow? Uh, yes, I do, said the Duke. Ah, hop in, replied Blondin. The crowd fell silent, but the Duke of Newcastle would not accept Blondin's challenge. Is there anyone else here who believes I could do it? asked Blondin. No one was willing to volunteer. Eventually, an old woman stepped out of the crowd and climbed into the wheelbarrow. Blondin wheeled her all the way across and all the way back. The old woman was Blondin's mother, the only person willing to put her life in his hands. Right, so, so children, this story about Blondin um, there's a, there's a little moral to the story, there's a little thing behind it, and that is that, you know, just as, as that little old lady had to trust Blondin to take him across, so we can't just say that we believe in Jesus, we need to actually put our trust in him and let him wheel us. So we need to, to actually just put our trust in, in Lord Jesus and listen to him and whatever he tells us to do. Right, I think Elder's got a great Sunday school for you today. Go and enjoy it, guys. <laughs> All right, friends, have you realized that in a culture where we live, that um, most people are very careful about what they say. They are so cautious about what to say. Um, you know, they don't, don't want to offend anyone. And usually, you know, they, and that's when they're in a face-to-face -face contact with people. I think when they, on the internet, it just goes out of the window. I don't know if you've realized this. You know, I've, I've sometimes, I'm quite astonished that when I read the, the comments people make after a sports article or after a, um, after a news article and I, or on an email, you know, and I just think, they don't think. It's like they think if they're safe, if they're on the other side of the computer. Um, anyway, the point I want to make, it's not about the internet, and another day I'll, I'll talk about that, you know, and people who say things on, on there. The point I'm making is that in general, our culture, doesn't want to rock the boat too much. You know, we, this, this is a mentality that often goes over to our spiritual lives as well. You know, we often think that our faith is, is a personal issue and that it should remain that way. Just don't say anything about your faith. You know, in case you offend someone. Now, it all sounds fine. It all sounds like we're just being sensitive to the needs of others. And that's great. You know, it's a Christian virtue and, and all those, uh, those things. But what we don't realize is that this will have a definite effect on our experience of our faith. In the way we experience God if we live like that. Now, in the West, over, overall, sort of in general, believers are very cautious in their faith lives. We believe the basic tenets of our faith. You know, we, we believe Jesus came. We, we believe that he showed us how to please God in the way we, we live. We believe he died for us. Um, we believe that that's the way we can have a relationship with the Father. And um, he rose from the dead and he overcame sin and he overcame death and he gave us eternal life. And we all believe that. But even though we believe it, we're often very reluctant to say what we believe in front of colleagues. Or friends who, who don't believe. 
Deep down, we believe that Jesus healed the sick. We believe that he performed amazing miracles. And we believe that maybe, yeah, actually, he can still do it today. We, we sort of believe that. We think he can do that if he, if he chooses to do it. But we don't tend to say it too loudly. We don't say, tend to say that God will deliver. God will do the impossible. He will intervene. We hope he will. But what if he doesn't? What if he doesn't? So we remain very cautious in our approach to our faith. You know, we mostly keep our beliefs to ourselves. So our beliefs remain in our hearts. Now, in contrast with this, believers in other parts of the world, especially in the developing world, like parts of Africa, parts of Asia, parts of Latin America, they have a totally different approach to faith. They read the stories in the Bible. They hear what God has done in the past. Um, and they read verses like um, Romans 1 verse 17. It says, the good news tells us how God makes us right in His sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, the righteous will live by faith. And in Hebrews 11 verse 6, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. So they say, well, you know, God is still the same as He was in the Bible. It's still the same God. He still expects us to live with faith. So let's just do it. Let's trust Him with abandon. And they totally trust Him with, with their whole lives. So to them, God is just part of their everyday lives. And when God does something amazing in their lives, they share it with others. They tell others their stories. You know, they make their faith known and they don't back down. They are not scared to take a public stand. They say, this is where I stand. This is what I believe. And they voice it. And they pray bold prayers. And they trust God for everything in their lives. From the mundane to the, the really special events. You know, they trust Him with, with everything in their lives. And they almost have the spirit of bravado. Or so it seems to us, who are a little bit more timid in our faith lives. You know, we look at them and think, oh, they're so brave. You know, but to them... It's not an unfounded bravado. They just have made a, a simple switch. And that is from believing what is written in the Bible to incorporating it into their lives. They've swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. And they live like it. It changed their lives. Now, in general, who do you think experienced the most miracles? Them or us? Who do you think? Them. They. They do. Yes, we experience miraculous things here as well. But it's like they are just much more open for the possibility that God may actually turn up and do something amazing in their lives. They're almost expecting it. And on the face of it, it, it for, for, to us it looks like their faith is just so strong. But it looks like God is actually like this verse says in Hebrews 11 verse 6, actually rewarding them who are so earnestly seeking Him. It's actually rewarding them for that. Now if you, if you look very carefully at it, it looks like this spirit of bravado comes from the fact that their faith has transitioned from a belief to a conviction. And that's why they can give voice to it in an unflinching way. You know, they are absolutely convinced that God can do the miraculous because they've experienced it. They've seen it. And it changed something in them. You know, they, they now focus on this part of their lives, not just as a belief, but as a conviction. And that makes all the difference. They don't just believe that God will intervene when they need Him. They know He will. They know it. And they know that this intervention can take many forms, from, a, from medication to the miraculous. But the fact is, they know it's all in God's hands. They know it's all in His hands, and they trust Him with it. So basically, it comes down to the difference between a conviction and a belief. Now, in modern psychology, we often work with, with beliefs, because the basic belief about beliefs is that it is changeable. Okay, let me just say that one again. The basic belief about beliefs is that it is changeable. I mean, I, I've told you about ABC theory before. I don't know if you remember it, but let me just refresh your, your memories. Basically... We believe that A stands for action. You know, something happened. There's, there's an event that happens to us. And then we believe, we think there's a consequence. You know, so we jump from 
A to C. You know, like for instance, you're, you're on a tube. I, I gave this um, example before. You're on a tube and it's hot and you're a little bit irritable and suddenly you feel somebody poking you in the back with a stick. And you feel sort of a little bit irritated and when it happens the second time, you, you feel your blood pressure rising. And then when it happens the third time and you get a stick in your back, you, you're ready to turn around and give you, them your special stare. You all have that stare, you know, and you, you're ready to give them that stare. And then you see it's a little old lady, you know, who's, who's blind and it's the white stick she's got in her hand that's poking you in the back. And suddenly the consequence is a little bit different. You're not so irritated anymore. You don't give them your stare. You actually think, well, how can you assist this lady? What, what can you do? How can you help her? So what happens between A and C? is B. And B stands for belief. And if you can change this, you change that. If you change B, you change C. Now, this is the basic premise of a therapy like CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. That's sort of the, the in thing if you go through the NHS, that's, that's the therapy they, they use now. Um, and, if you want to and that basically means if you can change the way somebody thinks, if you can change their basic beliefs, then you will change the way they act. You will change the consequences. So that's the way you, you basically help them. The bottom line of that theory is that beliefs are changeable. That's really what it comes down to. Beliefs are changeable. So it's something that is not so easily changeable. It's a belief that's become immovable because of the support you've gained for it. So it can almost be, de be described as You've become what you believe. A conviction is to become what you actually believe. Now, when you read a, the account of the first believers in the New Testament, you'll see that they didn't act out of changeable beliefs. They acted out of immovable conviction. That was the difference. That's why they were willing to die for the testimony that Jesus was raised from the dead. That was the reason. You know, I don't, now, now, I know skeptics will say, you know, they will often say, well, the first Christians... Um, you know, just because they were willing to die for their faith doesn't make it true. I mean, you don't have to go very far to find a few religious fanatics who will, will die for, for what they believe. And that doesn't make what they believe necessarily, that doesn't make it true. And I totally agree with that. How, however, friends, you have to remember that the people in the first church was in a very unique position. Because they knew whether they, what they said was true or not whether it was a lie. They knew whether Jesus was raised from the dead or not. And they chose to go to their deaths because they believed it to be true. Now, I mean, often people will be willing to die for what they believe to be the truth, but never have I heard of anyone who would be willing to die for what they knew was a lie. You wouldn't die for something if you knew it was a lie. Yet they were all willing to die for that. Makes you think. Also, friends, um, did you know where the first church started? It started in Jerusalem. And the, Jerusalem was the very place where all the events took place. If it wasn't the truth, there would be scores of people who would have, could have contradicted it. Scores of people could have said, but that's a lie. But it spread like wildfire amongst those people. The first day when, when Peter spoke about it, 3,000 people came to Christ. In Jerusalem, the place where the events could be verified or said it was a lie. In that place. So there were loads of eyewitnesses. So that, and, and you know what? These, the first believers, they didn't debate about what truth is. I know a lot of people these days say, what is truth and all those things. They didn't talk about what truth is. They talked about an event that happened. That's what I talked about. Jesus lived, Jesus died, and Jesus lived again. That's what happened. And they saw it, and they knew it was true, and they were totally convinced. And to them it wasn't a belief. To them it was a conviction. And that conviction drove them to action. They took action on it. Because action will always follow conviction. Now, just by the way, if we talk about apologetics, just one last thing about that, is that I think probably one of the strongest arguments for um, for the resurrection, you know, of Jesus, and how this event changed people is James, the brother of Jesus. Before the resurrection, we hardly hear anything about, about James, the brother of Jesus. You know, he's, he doesn't feature at all. But then Jesus is raised from the dead. 
And James becomes one of the pillars of the first church, of the early church. So he became totally and utterly convinced of Jesus' divinity. Do you get it? Let, let me just explain that again to you. Who of you have got brothers? Okay. What would it take for you to be convinced that your brother is the son of God? Probably quite a lot. Probably quite a lot. Yet this guy, James, was totally and utterly convinced that his brother was actually the son of God. Something amazing happened. Jesus was raised from the dead. Anyway, in Matthew 9, we encounter a story of two blind men who were following Jesus and asking for his help. Now, I believe that, that this story teaches us how to go from belief to conviction. Because that's really what we want. We want to go from belief to conviction. So just a bit of context. In, in Matthew 8, the chapter just before, we encounter a leper who said to Jesus the following. He said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Just of that, we encounter a, a centurion. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go and he goes, and that one, come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to, to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Okay, the third one, shortly after that, we read uh, about a synagogue leader. His name was Jairus. Read about him. A synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. And in the fourth one, the woman who suffered from bleeding, she said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And a woman was healed at that moment. Basically, friends, in all four of these cases, all four of these things that happened, they all believed in Jesus, what he could do for them. They believed in him. And they were convinced in their hearts before they went to him. And they just gave voice to it. They just said, this is what we believe. But then we encounter these two blind guys. Now, as Jesus went away from Jairus' house, he was walking to the place he was, was staying. And these two guys followed him. And they kept on shouting. He, he, they said, have mercy on a son of David. Have mercy on a son of David. So they used this term. Son of David is, is a term for a Messiah. You know, they, they prophesy that, that Jesus or that this person, would, the Messiah would come and he would be the savior of the people of Israel. So they used that term. They almost recognize him as, as, for who he was. But then he, he gets home. Jesus gets to the place where he was staying. And these two guys just walk in uninvited into the house. And up to this point, they displayed their belief that Jesus was the Messiah. And they were clearly tenacious and they were clear to break all social norms to get Jesus' help. But it seems as, as though something is missing in the story. Because Jesus then asks them a simple question. He looks at them and he says, Do you believe I can do this? Do you believe I can do this? Now, friends, this is the only place in the New Testament where Jesus requires those who ask for help to proclaim faith in him. Usually they just come out and say, this is what we believe. But this is the only place where Jesus actually has to ask them to say what they believe. And then they respond without, without hesitation and say, yes, Lord, yes, we believe. And Jesus stretches out his hands and he gives this powerful proclamation. He says, become what you believe. And he heals them. Become what you believe. Now, can you see what was missing in this story if you compare it to the previous four stories? Everyone else confessed that they believed that Jesus could heal them or the people that they petitioned for. To all of them, it was deeply connected to their hearts. It was convictions. But to the blind men, it was beliefs or a belief. Can you see that? They professed who Jesus was. They said, you're the Messiah, the son of David. So they believed some stuff about him, but they didn't believe in him yet, not fully. So Jesus just, just helped them to make that transition. He helped them to make that connection that he wasn't just the Messiah, that he wasn't just the savior of other people. He wanted to be their savior. 
He wanted to teach them how to grow from a belief to a conviction. And this happened by prompting them to verbalize what was in their hearts. That's how it happened. Because if you say what you believe publicly, you cement it in. You cement it in when you say it. This is different than just asking for mercy. This is stating your, your belief or your faith out loud so that it becomes a conviction. And the moment they made this transition, they became what they believed. It was no longer just an intellectual concept. It changed their lives. Friends, the key to changing your beliefs into convictions lies in verbalizing what you believe. For some reason, when we open our mouths to speak, something happens in our minds that reaffirms and strengthens our beliefs. You know, this is a principle I often, often use in coaching. You know, when I, I work with people, right at the end, I will usually ask them a question. I will say, um, what are you going to do as a result of our conversation here? And then they list all the action points. You know, they tell me exactly what they're going to do. And I know there's a much bigger chance when they do that, that they actually are going to follow through and do it, just because they said it out loud. Just because, because they said, I'm going to do this. I know they're probably going to do it. Rather than when I just left it at, you, you know, what we said in the session, they're probably not going to do it. They won't follow through. We see the same principle at, at weddings. You know, when people may, a couple may think they, they love each other, you know, and they, they will always be there for each other, but it needs to be verbalized to be internalized. It needs to be verbalized to be internalized. That's why people say it out loud. And that's why Paul says in Romans 10, he says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess your faith and are saved. As people of integrity, our confession makes public what is in our heart, and it ties us to what we believe. So when Jesus asked these two blind guys, do you believe I can do this? He gave them an opportunity to publicly verbalize their faith that he's not only capable, but he's also willing to heal them. So let me ask you, what do you believe? What do you believe? Do you just believe in God intellectually? Or do you believe that he actually cares about you? Do you believe that he wants to intervene in your life? Do you know about him, or do you actually know him? God loves you, and he wants to be involved in your life. And the miracles we read about in the Bible, the miracles we read about, you know, all the accounts in, in different parts of the world, in other parts of the world, developing world, it can happen here as well. It can happen here. We need to start to step out in faith. We need, to, we need to become what we believe, what we say we believe. We need to become that. But what if you struggle with this? What if you believe but it's not a conviction yet? What if you like this, um, you know, the, the father in Mark, that we encounter in Mark 9? You know, this, this guy that um, he wanted Jesus to heal his son. And he didn't do it because he was convinced that Jesus could help him. You know, he wasn't, it wasn't a conviction in his heart yet. It was more like, you know, he tried different things in the past and, and he just lost hope along the way. So in this case, it was more like, you know, well, so many people have tried before um, and they failed. So, so if you can do anything, please give it a shot, Jesus. Won't you just try, please? That was sort of his attitude. And then Jesus responds. He says, if you can, just say, Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. And immediately the, fa the boy's father exclaimed, exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt like this, this guy? You believe. You know, you've got the faith. But at the same time, you struggle with unbelief. You struggle with all these doubts. You believe in your heart. But it's not a conviction yet. It's not a conviction yet. So you don't voice it. Friends, maybe it's time for you to take three simple steps. Number one, make sure you know what you believe. Number two, say 
what you believe publicly. And number three, ask Jesus to help you where you still struggle with unbelief. Those three steps. Let him help you with it. You know, belief is something that's supported by, by experience and knowledge. Let me put it this way. So a little diagram, another diagram. Um, put action here. And then we'll put conviction. Uh, we'll put belief. And then we put experience. And support. Okay. Now, the more experience and support we've got for our belief, can you guys see? Okay. For our for our belief, the stronger this belief will come, will become. You know, it will grow. This belief will grow stronger and stronger. The more experience we we have, the more support we gather for it. You know, it will just become stronger and stronger. So this thing will grow and grow, and this belief will grow until it breaks through a barrier. And then it becomes a conviction. Okay, now this barrier that it needs to break through is where you actually verbalize what you believe. Over here, doubt exists in heaps. There's a lot of doubt under this line. Once you've crossed over this line to conviction, doubt doesn't exist so much anymore. It doesn't mean there won't be times when you feel weak. It doesn't mean that there won't be times where, where you feel doubtful or, or struggling with it. It just means that you know you've encountered God and you know because of the support you've gathered, because of the experience you've got, you know that He will lead you through those times. You know it with certainty that he will guide you through those times. And you know what happens then? When it's such a strong conviction, it always leads into action. You always act on it. We need to start living here. We need to live more here than here. Let me tell you a story of how this happened to me recently. Um, you know, where, where I actually felt myself transition from a belief to a conviction that led to action. It was, um, well, about six weeks ago, it was a South African festival year, where you, were you all here at a South African festival? Great day, amazing day. Um, and now, we were praying for good weather for that day for a very long time. You know, we had a whole team praying for good weather. And um, as I was sitting in my, my car preaching, I don't know if you've seen me before, I always sit in my car preach before, that's the, um, that, that steering wheel has heard so many sermons, I, I tell you. I, I always preach beforehand, go through my sermon notes. And I was sitting there, going through the notes, and I was sort of halfway through my sermon, and um, it was shortly before the service were to start, and the heavens opened. And I mean, it opened. It really came down. It was like a thunderstorm, you know, and the wind was blowing and the, the rain just came down. And I sat there, because it wasn't a drizzle, you know, this was, was proper rain. And I sat there and I thought, oh boy, what now? And I just got this clear whisper in my heart. Don't worry. Just focus on what you need to do. Okay, so don't worry. Just focus on what you need to do. So I thought, okay, what do I need to do? I need to preach. So I, I looked down at my sermon notes and I just started again where I, where I left off. And you know what the very next words were? The very next words in my sermon was, maybe Jesus is whispering to you today, do not be afraid, just believe. And it just struck me. Bowled me out. You know, I, I, I just thought, wow, maybe Jesus is whispering that to me today. You know, don't be afraid, just, just believe. And I decided, in that moment, this belief became very, very strong in my heart. Because it actually rose just to under, underneath this line. Because I had the experience, this happened before to me, and I had the support, you know, I knew God was speaking to me, it was so clear in that moment. But it was still just in my heart. It was a strong belief, but it was just in my heart. And then I got out of the car and I said hello to people and, and um, somebody said something about the weather. And... I was on the point of saying, 
yeah, it was just a pity that it rained. You know, I was on the point of saying that, sort of just an off-the-cuff off remark, you know, like we, we often say. Uh, it was a non-thinking natural response that I wanted to say. And, I, and then I stopped and I said, I looked at him and I said, don't worry, it's going to clear soon. And in that moment, I transitioned from a belief to a conviction. The moment I verbalized it. The moment I said what was in my heart. Because I knew, without a doubt, that it was true. So we came in, we sang some worship songs, and you know what? The last song that we sang was, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hand hath made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. And some of you will know what I prayed when I came up. I came and I said a prayer. And the prayer was more or less this. I said, Lord, thank you that we saw you in the storm earlier. And thank you that we are going to see you in the sun that will shine a little bit later. Can you remember that? Can you remember that prayer? That was a bold prayer, friends. But to me, it wasn't brave. It wasn't bold. To me, it was so rooted in, it was a conviction. I knew that to be true when I prayed it. And you know what? Because I knew that, I, they, we had a lot of visitors here. And it was like, you know, <laughs> the, the worst time to do something like that if you don't really believe it. And I, I really believed it because I put all my eggs in one basket because I knew that God was holding that basket. I knew he was holding that basket. So I knew it was safe. It was a safe bet. Do you know what happened next? I started preaching. And as I got to this line, as I got to this line, I said, and maybe Jesus is whispering to you today, do not be afraid, just believe in me, I said. The sun broke through and it shone into the building. And I know some of you made a connection. Some of you saw the sun and you thought, wow, this is amazing. You don't know what happened in the car. You don't know how precise God is and how he just intervened in that moment. And he just said to me, you know what? When you put your trust in me, it's not misplaced. It's not misplaced. It's the only place you can put your trust. It's the only place. And that strengthened my faith immensely. Strengthened it immensely. So how can you strengthen your beliefs? Let's go to a great theologian, Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood said, what you put into your life is what you get out of it. What you put into your life is what you get out of it. It's all about what you put in. Now, I'm not going to tell you what you shouldn't put out in all the bad stuff that you should refrain from putting in. And, and I'm not even going to talk about all the good stuff. I'm just going to give you four quick suggestions of how you can put it in. Okay, how you can put stuff in your mind that's good and in your heart that, that will strengthen your belief. Number one, spend regular time with God and ask Him to open your eyes so that you can see He's working in your life and in the lives of others around you. So, spend time with Him. Number two, read material from trusted and reliable sources that will build your beliefs. You know, when you hear reports about stuff that don't have a logical explanation, you know, and, and you know it, it's not possible without... God's intervention, and you realize that, your faith will be strengthened. Number three, listen to podcasts from well-known biblical teachers, people like, like Rick Warren, like Bill Hybels, like Andy Stanley. Listen to those guys. You know, it will strengthen your faith. And number four, spend time with those whose beliefs have become convictions about their faith. And one of the best opportunities for that is in a month's time, an our annual breakaway weekend on the 4th to the 6th of September. Please, if you haven't booked your places yet, book it. It's very important because you will build friendships with people who will build your faith. And that's a win-win situation. So do that. Friends, God is an amazing God. And He wants to be in a personal relationship with each one of you. He wants to be involved in your everyday lives. And He wants to be part of your challenges. He wants to be part of your um, opportunities. He wants to be part of your struggles. Let Him in. Let Him in. Don't let your faith just remain an intellectual issue. Something that was done 2,000 years ago on the cross and through Jesus' resurrection. Make it your own. Make it your own. Realize that God still does miracles. And He still wants to be part of your life. So go and make sure what you believe. And then I want to challenge you to take the next step. To make it public. Let it go from a belief to a conviction. 
and then you will be able to act on it. And it will change your life, and it will change the lives of the people around you. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we believe. Help us in our unbelief. You know that it's sometimes difficult, Lord, to, to voice what we actually believe, and we ask you that you will help us with that, that you will help us to, to cement in what is in our hearts, that we will be able to say what we actually believe, and then to become what we believe. Please help us with this, Lord. We put our faith in you, and we ask you to lead us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.